Hi there, AP seminar students and teachers. I'm so glad that you could join me today as we walk through um, AP seminar. Before we begin, I want to introduce myself. My name is Allison Malloy. I'm a teacher at Carmel High School in Carmel, Indiana, which is just north of Indianapolis, for those of you familiar with the Midwest. Today, our focus is going to be on working through the stimulus material. So if you look at the top of this slide, we'll see our learning objective, which is to employ appropriate reading strategies and read critically for specific purpose. For those of you who are students, you're probably thinking, put that in my terms. So what that means is we are going to walk through the requirements of the IWA, specifically focusing on the role of the stimulus material. Um, we wanna make sure we understand how we're going to be as uh, assessed and then beyond that, we wanna make sure that we understand the difference between on topic and off topic and essential and non-essential use as it pertains to the stimulus materials. Because ultimately with the IWA, the stimulus materials play a significant role in how you will be assessed. Okay, so let's begin today by actually starting with some clarification on definitions. So at some point over the course of the year, your teachers have most likely gone over these definitions with you, whether they've shown you the exact glossary in the course and exam description um, is up to them. However, we have some consistent terms we wanna make sure that we're all on the same page as it pertains to. So if you look at the top, as we go through the rubric, these are gonna be terms that you're gonna see in the task directions as well as the rubric. So let's start off with argument. An argument is a claim or a thesis that conveys a perspective developed through a line of reasoning, which is supported by evidence. So let's go down to the bottom where it says perspective, just to make sure we're on the same page. A point of view conveyed through an argument. So as you're going through all of this stuff with the IWA, it is super important that we pay attention to those two terms. Perspective is synonymous with argument, and an argument is a claim that shows that perspective, okay? So make sure we keep those clear so whenever we see those terms, we know what we're, we're talking about. Um, claim is also there because claim is an argument. It's a statement made that asserts a perspective. Remember, claims are debatable, whereas when you go down to evidence, this is going to be information that's used to help support the claim. So the evidence is going to be the support. Um, conclusion is an understanding resulting from analysis. Um, and then if you look where implication is, that's going to be a possible future effect or result that can be intended or non-intended. Um, a limitation is a point in which your argument um, isn't valid or this is a weak spot in what we're saying. Um, point of view is the position that you're taking on a topic. Um, and then resolution is the act of solving a problem and solution is the means of answering a question or addressing a problem. Now, hopefully that was all review, but if not, this is a slide you can come back to as we're working through the rubric to make sure that you fully understand those terms as we use them, okay? So let's get into the task directions. If you have your stimulus packet handy, you can pull that out because you'll see in the beginning of the packet is the task directions. If you don't, that will be linked in the video and you can pause and go back and, and get that information. So at the top, what you'll first notice is that there are seven stimulus sources that are referenced. The ones in yellow will be the ones we discuss further in lesson two. The ones that are in teal will be the ones that we discuss further in lesson three, okay? Um, so if we look at the task directions, you know, what's the role of the stimulus? Your job is to read and analyze the provided stimulus sources to identify a theme or connection among the sources um, for possible areas of inquiry. So basically what you're going to do is you're going to find your topic um, is coming from the stimulus material. So you read these and you're inspired to then create this topic, okay? Um, you're going to compose that research question of your own, which is prompted by the stimulus. So again, the stimulus are playing a role in inspiration. You're going to gather information from a range of sources. Um, it's important, as they've noted there, including scholarly work. We want to make sure we're including peer-reviewed sources, not just all pieces of journalism. Um, so, you know, when you're thinking about peer-reviewed, what does that mean? How do we know that they're experts and what have they done to vet that? Right, so we wanna look for journal articles on databases. Um, those are great places to go um, so that we know we're getting more of those scholarly works. Now, if you notice on the bottom, I've highlighted in purple a major point of this. So your job is to analyze, evaluate, and select evidence 
but then you, you need to use that to develop a well-reasoned argument that conveys your perspective. So if we go back to the glossary when we talked about terms, remember we talked about how perspective is an argument. Now what's really important here is it doesn't say conveys perspectives, it says conveys your perspective. So if you think back to the IRR, your job was to say, here's what source A says, here's their argument, here's the strengths and limitations, here's how it compares to source B, right? You're putting those sources in conversation. Here, it's one more step. So rather than putting those sources in conversation to show the existing research and the existing conversation, much like a lit review, your job here is to take all of that to make your own argument. So if the sources say this, how can I use that to support my own claims and my own stance? It's about you here, not necessarily what the sources say. All right, so if we continue with the task directions, your job then is to continually revisit and revise your original research question. So I also teach AP research, and one of the big points in that class is to make sure your research aligns because you're you know, dealing with a year-long investigation. However, as a seminar teacher, I noticed that same problem happens in the IRR and IWA. That issue with alignment, right? We write the question early, we've done a little bit of research, we have an idea, then we start writing the paper. But here's the problem. You know, when we're no longer um, stuck at home and we can actually travel again, it's like taking a trip, right? You have a roadmap, you think you know where you're gonna go, but maybe you get hungry a little bit earlier or roads close and you have to change your path, right? Do you go back and then change the map saying, oh, this is the exact trip that we took? you may not know in advance what that trip's going to look like until you've actually done it. So it's really important that you go back at the end of your paper and make sure your question aligns with what you actually did. So a good practice for this would be to go back to your IRR, look at your question, look at what you did, is that actually what you answered? And as you go through the IWA, it's super important that even though we wrote it on the front end, we wanna make sure we're continually coming back and refining the question to make sure it actually matches. We also want to make sure that we are identifying opposing or alternate um, points of view and their implications and limitations. Remember, we're looking at what are those limitations and what are those consequences, okay? If you're trying to build a truly complex argument, we have to acknowledge concessions. If I were writing an essay about cost of college, for example, right, I have to concede and say college costs too much. I could have a rebuttal saying that it's worth it, but ultimately I have to acknowledge that there is a limitation um, to my stance. And that's how we know it's really complex because if I'm trying to sell somebody and really make a good argument, I'm considering those objectives or objections or concessions that I might need to make. Okay, so let's talk about what this actually means. So when you build your argument, here's where this becomes really clear on what you have to do with the stimulus material, okay? Number one, you have to identify and explain the relationship of your inquiry to a theme or connection among at least two of the stimulus materials prompted by your reading. Now I'm gonna read the next line, then I'm gonna clarify. Incorporate at least one of the stimulus material into your argument, okay? So here's what this means. I'm gonna go back a slide. So I read these seven sources. My job is to make sure that I have a clear connection between two of the sources. Those two sources have established my question and the relationship that my question has to the stimulus material. So if I'm not connecting two, I have a problem. Now we have not in any way talked about the stimulus, but let's just look at the titles and kind of talk about what this would look like. So let's do the third one here on high income. High income improves evaluation of life, but not necessarily emotional well-being. So if we just use the title, and we can infer based on the title, high income improves life evaluation. So if you have more money, you have a better evaluation of life. Straightforward, straight from the title. If I decided that I was making my research question inspired by only that source, right, just one source, if I go back to what it says here, the relationship to a theme among two, then I would not score well because my relationship is not to two sources. I have to only use one source in my paper, but I have to be connected to two. And so that's where it becomes a little bit confusing for some students. I'm connected to two, but I only have to use one in my argument. As someone who's graded the IWA previously though, I would strongly encourage you to try to use
didn't have to because it clearly says at least one, but you can if you want to show that connection. It will help you because a lot of students, the first use wasn't all that great, but the second use is where they really hit their stride and used it really well, okay? We have to then place our research question in context. We have to include perspectives, include evidence from a range. We have to link our claims. All of that stuff we'll talk further about as we go into more lessons, but the one I wanna draw your attention to is the next one that says provide specific resolutions, conclusions, and or solutions. One of the things I've highlighted is that and or. There is some confusion among students in terms of what they actually need to do here. It does not say that you need a resolution, a conclusion, and solution. It says and or. So keep in mind that all of your teachers and college board and all of your graders want you to do one thing really well rather than do multiple things and not do them quite as well. So if you are arguing for a conclusion, right? I'm arguing that doctors should learn Spanish, okay? If that's the conclusion I'm arguing for, then I don't have to prove the solution of what that's going to look like. If I argued that doctors should learn Spanish and then I argued that colleges, med school should require doctors to have um, four years of Spanish before they can be licensed or something like that, those are different goals. But I don't wanna put those two in the same paper because doing so in 2,000 words, only 2,000 words, I would not be able to do both of them well. So I wanna be very aware of what my goal is and stay tied to that purpose and not try to take on too much. Because again, you only have 2,000 words to do this. Now, while I bring up the word count, which you can see under here, 2,000 word limit, that does not count any of your footnotes, bibliography, figures, visuals that you might have in text. Now, some of you are a little bit tricky and like to put some, some extra stuff in your footnotes in terms of like using it as extra words or you want to include an annotated bibliography. Those kinds of things would not be read um, as they would you know, give you an advantage of getting more than the 2,000 words and we stick to that 2,000 words. You do get a 10% overage, so 2,200 words um, is the max of what you can do. And now keep in mind, I know some of you, um, at least the students I have, so I know some of you watching are this too, um, like to push that word count as much as you can. If you are someone who's pushing over that 2,200, remember that College Board says you can do this really well in 2,000 words, so trust them. They would not make this task um, impossible. So it might just be a matter of being more concise, which is something we'll talk about in later lessons, okay? Um, and so let's continue forward into now what is being assessed. So if you look at the proficiencies that are highlighted um, in yellow down there, we're gonna focus on establishing arguments, selecting and using evidence, understanding and analyzing context, understand and analyze perspective, and applying conventions. On the next couple slides, we will talk through what each of these mean in detail. Before we do that, I want to draw your attention to the note that is on the top of the IWA um, rubric, and it's really, really significant. So let's look at the bottom. For the purposes of the IWA, if the response is not in any way related to a theme connecting at least two of the stimulus material, it will be counted as off as off topic and will receive a score of a zero. So remember we talked about a couple slides ago how important it was to connect it to two sources, right? But if you can't connect it to two sources and it's not in any way related, it's going to be off topic and you're gonna get a zero. And think about the implications of that, right? What are, what's the consequences? You did all of this work to earn a zero like what's the point of even doing it, right? So we wanna make sure we're really, really clear at the beginning and we put a lot of focus into picking the right question and making sure we're connected. So just to give you an example, this is the stimulus material from 2018, okay? Um, so if you just look at the titles and granted, we didn't do a deep dive, we didn't read it, um, but we've got a world without work, the myth of Sisyphus, long working hours and cancer, Rosie the Riveter, which is the we can do it image, um, Nixon's address to the nation on Labor Day, and then Adam Smith from The Wealth of Nations, okay? Without knowing much about it, if we just look at titles, you can see some connecting idea there had to do with work, okay? So if I'm trying to figure out what off topic is, I'm a huge basketball fan, okay? So if I said, you know what? I think LeBron James is awesome. He does work, right? So now I'm connected. Is that, is that work? Could I just argue for my paper why LeBron James is the greatest basketball player to ever play? 
No, because again, I have to use these sources in my paper. There's nothing on here that I would be able to use to argue why LeBron James is great. Now, if I want to shift this because I really want to talk about basketball, then I could look at the sources. And maybe this third source about long working hours and a cancer risk makes me think about people whose job requires them to travel consistently, right? Or maybe those who have jobs where there's a physical toll. Now I can start to connect this to NBA athletes and I can look at the implications of those, the travel schedule with potentially their risk of certain diseases or health risks or mental health risks. Now I'm starting to ground it in research, okay? So I'm off topic if I just pick something random and I see no connection. I'm on topic if I can show the connection between two. Now I showed the connection there between one, right? Long working hours and cancer risk. So how can I then connect it to the other sources? Well, if I do a deeper reading, then maybe there's something in Derek Thompson or maybe there's something in Nixon that I can pull in to show this connection, okay? You have to ground this in stimulus material. If you don't, and we go back a slide, you are getting a zero right? No stimulus material, no grade. That's not going to be a good thing, okay? So let's move forward and actually talk about the rubric. So if you look at rubric row number one, okay, I know it doesn't look this way, but if we think about points earned, okay, you're going to earn points for a high scoring use of this. If you think about scoring a zero as a medium and a low, that'll help you better understand what this is actually going to look like. So you're gonna earn points. The response demonstrates the relevance of at least one of the stimulus to be um, to the argument by integrating it as part of the response. It can provide relevant context for the question or as evidence to support. So you're gonna earn a point in this row if you actually use the stimulus, okay? You'll earn zero points if you do one of the two things. Either you don't incorporate it, so that's the A, or you include a discussion of at least one of the stimulus, however, it doesn't contribute. So if you think of that top part as the low and the bottom part as a medium, we want to make sure that we're not just throwing it in or doing it in a um, real surface level way. Now, one additional clarification I want to add here, right? We have to be connected to two to get scored. But in this row, you have to actually use the stimulus to then earn the five points. So you could get scored, but earn a zero for use of stimulus if you don't do a good job in how you actually use it, okay? Knowing that you are only scored on your IRR and IWA, it's important that we not give up five points from the beginning, especially when this is completely in your control. So let's look at some examples, okay? I'm gonna give you a minute to read through this. Okay, if you notice that the highlighted terms, um, British Journal of Cancer addressed to the nation on Labor Day, those are two stimulus material that we just talked about, okay? Even if you're not done reading, I wanna make sure we maximize our time, so I'm gonna go through just what the student is doing. So the study from the British Journal of Cancer suggests that long working hours may share a link to long-term risks such as breast cancer. Former U.S. President Nixon on his address to, to Labor Day said, we must always remember the most important part of quality is quality of work. So the student's clearly connected to two sources, right? We see that. However, if we look at where this paragraph goes at the end, such evaluation brings up the question, what do the current health impacts of night shift suggest about the need for future regulation? So this student wants to look at how we should be regulating, what are the needs for regulation of future night shift workers? They use the two sources, the student used the two sources to set up the topic. This is not essential use, right? Think of this in terms of going to a party. If you go to a party or a family gathering with a friend and they introduce you, but then you don't interact with anybody else, you're never mentioned again, 
realistically, you could walk out of that room and nobody would know. The, the room wouldn't change, the dynamic wouldn't change. You were just introduced, but then that was it. And that's what we have here. This example is introducing the topic. It's not necessarily essential. So this is where it would fall on that rubric. If we go back a slide, it's gonna fall in this other use. There's a discussion. However, it's not really contributing to the argument. It's just helping to set up the question. Now, the difference becomes if we go to this second example, right? If you go to that same party and now your friend introduces you and makes you a part and threads you into different conversations, you interact, now you become essential. If you leave, people would notice. It's the same thing with the stimulus material. If it is essential, your argument changes because it is removed. So an unbiased study with a sample size of 116,462 individuals conducted by researchers from the British Journal of Cancer suggests an association between long working hours and breast cancer. The findings can indicate that night workers who work long hours have a higher chance of developing breast cancer, although analysis of the study's confounding variables proposes no link. So they've done a really good job, the student implemented that. Now, if we look at the end of the paragraph, the concern for breast cancer thus extends to more than just night workers who have long shifts. This is becoming threaded and it's becoming essential. If I remove this reference to the British Journal of Cancer, I have significantly changed the strength of this paragraph. So this now becomes essential use. Now, the lucky thing for this student is what we saw in the last slide and this slide are all from the same paper which is why it's so important that you use it more than one time, because that gives you more chances to actually earn your points. All right, so let's look at this one, and I want you to tell me if it's essential use. So Thatcher, what is highlighted is the example. I'll give you one minute to read through this. And again, we're just reading quickly kind of for gist. Right, so if we look at the use of Thatcher, this is, an uns this is unsurprising given that technology has increasingly been a key tool to facilitate scientific understanding of complex problems ranging from global, global climate change, Thatcher, to urban transformation. So we actually, and I should have highlighted Montgomery too, we've got Thatcher and Montgomery both used, but here's the problem. This is that, that second level of the rubric, right? They mentioned it, but it's surface level, it's non-essential, it's just thrown in. One of the tips and tricks to making sure you have essential use is to use it one, outside of the introduction, and two, to make sure you're actually using a piece of textual evidence to help ground it. The third suggestion is to make sure you're interacting with other sources, interacting with the source that you included, so that way there's a clear connection and it feels like it's, it's significant. So if you look at the difference here, we've got Montgomery down here, just look at the change in how they did it. Um, a relevant example, so up here they're talking about, um, you know, if you look, such a restrictive nature of this issue makes data a science very useful tools that generates reliable predictions about certain systems or phenomena, which allow people to allocate the available research resources in the most efficient manner and prepare for the future a relevant example of this. So now, in order to make their point, right, how businesses and sports are no means the only fields where the predictive capacity of data and science is employed, here's an example as they're talking about sustainability related products. Now let's look at this example found in the stimulus. We have a clear reference and a whole quoted line there. And then there's more connection about how this article suggests and that is then connected to another source with, we've got more Montgomery down here, right? So we have this clear connection where Montgomery is now becoming a big essential part of the argument, not just something I threw in and said, hey, this talks about urban transformation, which makes me think about this. So therefore it's there. It needs to be grounded, okay? So hopefully that's very clear. 
Now let's look at row two. Row two, again, we're thinking of those all or nothing rows as low, medium versus high. So in the five points, the response explains the significance or importance of the research question by situating it within the larger context. What that means is, did you tell us why your topic matters using evidence or support from the larger existing conversation, okay? If you didn't, you either A, provided no context, or B, you made a really simplistic or general reference, right? We have that low and the medium are going to get no points, and the high score is going to get the points here. Again, this is not five points you want to give up. So this is not that difficult to include, but let's talk about what it looks like. So if we go back to that first night shift paper, and she's talking about regulations on night shift, what we see up here is um, harboring more than 21 million workers. So how do I know it matters? Well, it affects 21 million workers. And I used a source to say that night shift is, is very prevalent. I also talked about how OSHA or any federal law doesn't have specific requirements for night shift workers. That then helps ground this in very clear textual evidence. Here's how it fits into the larger conversation which is why then I'm arguing about the impacts of night shift, okay? Hopefully that's very clear in this row. It's not as complicated as the use of stimulus. This is really like, did you tell us why, why we should care? That's all it is. So if I go back to my paper and I wanna argue about how travel is affecting athletes, then I need to make sure, or professional athletes, that I tell you why, why it matters. Because if I don't, I'm losing points on this row. All right, so let's go into rows three, four, and five. And I want to preface this by saying beyond row one and two, I really want to just give you the forest on these other rows so that you understand where you're going. But future lessons will really focus on rows three, four, and five. So as we go through and talk about putting together the pieces of your argument, um, lessons five through eight will really cover these in a lot more detail, okay? So let's just look at the high scoring rows um, so we can be very clear about what you need to know. And then we'll just look at the differences between the two. So for the for row three, you're looking at perspective. You're evaluating multiple perspectives. Again, think of the word argument. And you're synthesizing them or bringing them together by drawing relevant connections between them. Consider objections, implications, and limitations. Again, I'm not just going into Google and saying school should start later. And then I'm going to find a bunch of sources all from students who say that school should start later. I wanna make sure that I'm finding a variety of points of view. So teachers, students, um, government officials, lawmakers, Department of Ed, whatever I wanna look at. Um, and then I wanna also put that in conversation um, with my argument. So how can those help to enhance, complicate, confirm the things that I'm arguing? The middle row says you describe them, but you're really just describing the differences, so that's going to feel more like an IRR than synthesizing them, okay? Um, the low, you only provided a single perspective or you just unsubstantiated, which means that you just wrote a lot, which some students do, but there really wasn't any evidence to support what you were saying, okay? You will notice that row four is the heaviest of all rows. It's the worth the most points at 12 points, but this row is essentially looking at you prevent providing a really clear and engaging and organized argument. So you have a clear and convincing argument. It's logically organized. It's well-reasoned. Um, your claims are connected to your evidence and you have a plausible, well-aligned conclusion, okay? Um, again, the goal here is, did you make a claim? Did you use the evidence to support it? And were you complex in how you presented it considering limitations, implications, all of that stuff? So the middle row, you presented a, a clear claim, an argument, but you had a little bit of flaws. You were very organized, but maybe your reason was faulty in points, or maybe you could have been more organized um, as you put all of that stuff together. Okay, and then again, unsubstantiated or it's just summary is going to get you those low scores. And then five is the use of evidence, relevant and credible evidence. And you also want to make sure it's sufficient. Did I use enough? Did I use that evidence to support my claims? A mid, middle score is going to be that if you mostly did, and then a low score is it's going to be that you lacked credibility, okay? So again, these rows will be covered in much greater detail, but the idea here is that they're asking about how you're formulating your argument. So if we look at an example of this, and the reason I picked this example is I highlighted 
two different stimulus sources from that 2018 packet that a student had used to actually put this into conversation. So what's really cool here is that this student is talking about how we can use data analysis as a means of decision making um, on sustainability. Um, and so if we're looking at this last line, which is super important, the use of VR in journalism shows potential as it may be able to mitigate, if not eliminate, miscommunication and misunderstanding due to journalist bias. So if we could use VR to do that, look at what this stimulus says, look at what this stimulus says to make our point. Now this is inverse because most of you would put your claim at the top and then use your evidence to support it. This student did it in reverse, that's totally fine. But what we see here is that those stimulus sources are being used as support for potential ways to implement VR in journalism. So not only is this essential use, but it's also a good argument of how you use sources to prove your point. Because when you're making your argument, it's not about what the sources say, it's about how what the sources say can be used to help you advance, complicate, confirm, extend your argument, okay? All right, so we are almost done with this rubric. So here we go, rows six and seven. Row six is about conventions. This is how you cite things. Um, it's the attribution that you're giving. So I'm gonna go in the reverse order. If you look at the low, the only way you're getting a low is if you don't have your reference page, but you have in-text citations or vice versa. Okay, so most of you are not getting that zero there um, because you hopefully have both. Um, we're looking for consistency. It does not matter in any capacity what citation style you cite in in AP seminar. What does matter is that you are consistent with that. So one of the things you can look at the difference between a medium and low is, is consistency, okay? So if you went back to your IRR right now and you looked at all of your references on your reference page, or excited page, bibliography, and then you went back into your paper, do those match? And what I mean by that is if I looked at Smith, could I find Smith in the paper or did you call Smith something else, right? Is Smith on the reference page at, and in the paper? If it's not in both places, if I can't tell which one's which, or if it's just a bunch of URLs, please don't do that. You want to make sure they align. We're looking for consistency, okay? We also wanna make sure we're giving credit because that is super important because those ideas, when they are not yours, need to be given and attributed. The last row then, row seven, is looking at your style, the way that you're actually writing. So even though your friends can be super educated, we're going to pretend that we're not writing for our friends, but writing for an educated, non-specialized, or even specialized audience. They're an educated audience, okay? We talk to our friends in a different capacity than we talk to adults or to an educated population of people that we're not as comfortable with. Okay, so things like the word you, if you use the word you a lot, don't, right? Go back to your IRR and get rid of those. Um, but if you use it in here, it's just a way that it makes it informal. If you use a lot of slang, if you have, the other part of this is typos, right? We wanna make sure that we're cleaning up our paper so it's clearly communicating and appropriate for the academic audience. College Board does not expect you to be perfect here by any means, but they do expect you to proofread. The middle row is mostly clear, but there's some more flaws that actually um, are inappropriate or could interfere in understanding. And a low is just it would be riddled with errors. Okay. Um, so let's go back to everything we've covered today because we've done a lot in just a little bit of time. So our objectives were to make sure that we understood um, the requirements of the IWA, including the, roast, the role of the stimulus material, to make sure that we understood how we'd be assessed and to make sure we understood the definition of off topic and essential use. So keep in mind that the purpose of the stimulus material is to inspire a topic inspired by a connection among two sources and then you have to use one in an essential way. Think about that party analogy. If, you, if your source were just to leave, it would be eliminated from your paper, would it matter? Would anybody notice? And if the answer is no, nobody would notice, it doesn't matter it's not essential use. So we wanna make sure that we are very clear about the importance. We also wanna make sure that if we're on topic, we are inspired by two, not just one, but two, um, and that we can use the stimulus to help back that up, okay? Um, hopefully, again, we have hit all of those objectives and you are very clear on what you need to do. Again, it's just a forest. You're building an argument here um, and we're making sure we're using that stimulus to do that. 
one of the awesome things about AP Seminar and the Capstone Program in general is it's empowering you. So here's your chance to be empowered and to make your argument rather than just rely on the arguments that other people have already made. Okay. Um, so if we look at next steps, your job between now and the next lesson is to access the stimulus material. You can find this in the digital portfolio. Your teacher should have or will be providing you with a copy of this material, but you can also find a link in the videos for the next few lessons. Your job is just to familiarize yourself with the stimulus material if you have time to do that. You can do a deeper dive later. The idea is just to get a basic overview at this point and that is enough. The highlighted sources from the stimulus material will be the sources that we will cover in lesson two. The ones that are not highlighted will be covered in lesson three. If you are having any trouble with connection or technology, um, make sure that you talk to College Board. They are committed to the equity and access piece, and they recognize that not all of you have the tools that you need. So if you could contact them at cb.org backslash tech, um, they will be happy to help you as you, as you need. So again, thank you so much for watching. I hope that you'll join us for the next videos with AP Seminar. Have a wonderful day.